You know, I like definite, bottom line, to the point verses from God's Word. And such a truth is found in Jeremiah the 29th chapter, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And I'd like to just give a title to the message today, What God Thinks About You. Did you ever hear someone say something? You say, but what are you really thinking? What are you really saying? Now, this is one you don't need Greek or Hebrew. You don't need a seminary professor to interpret or reinterpret it for you. It says in Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, no higher authority. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. Ladies and gentlemen, this is so simple yet so powerful, you just have to have outside help to misinterpret when God himself said, I know, don't argue with God. God knows what he's thinking. You may not know what I'm thinking, and I may not know what you're thinking, but God knows what he's thinking. And God said, I know the thoughts. I'm thinking about you right now. And only God has the ability to think about everyone in this universe and do it successfully. Now, as we look at these verses that are before us, God said, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you. Regardless of where you have been or what you have done, God said, I'm thinking thoughts of peace toward you. Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. On the raging sea, he said, Peace be still, and the waves were calm. Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. His thoughts of me are peace. His thoughts of you are not evil. God cannot think evil thoughts. His thoughts for you are good thoughts, not evil thoughts. And God wants to give you an expected end. In other words, what your heart really desires that is in line with God's Word. Godly desires are given by God. And different people have different desires. Some of us seek more in certain areas than others. And other, you know, that can go on uh, into different ways. But God wants to give you an expected or a good a wonderful end. In fact, the Bible said the path of the just shines brighter and brighter under the perfect day. The path of the evil one gets worse and worse and declines and declines until the end are the ways of death. The wages of sin is death. But the path of the just shines brighter and brighter. And though that light may be challenged, God will bring it through. God wants to hear and answer your prayers. I mean, that's another major thought that God has. Then shall you call upon me and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. There's a very simple expression, and I want to give it while it's in my spirit right now. God is calling for quality, uninterrupted time with him. I'm glad you took five minutes with your cup of coffee to read the promise out of the promise box. But then all day long we give our attention to sometimes trivia. Sometimes to people who have absolutely nothing to say. You'll listen to endless expressions that are not eternal and really don't help you in the now. God's calling for us. However it has to come about. 
If it's 30 minutes earlier, if it's an hour earlier, God wants quality, uninterrupted time in His presence. Personally, I found that very early in the morning, when our spirits are quiet, which is the biggest challenge that I think all of us have in a busy world, you know, just a shorter period of time, it's amazing what God can speak to you when there's not 10 radios going in your own heart. The noise, you know, the traffic noise, the house noise, I mean, you know, all of the even legitimate sounds of life that you can hear the still small voice of the Lord. In fact, he said, be still and know that I am God. We hear every voice but God's sometimes. We hear everyone's opinion but God's. And then we carry this thing around, well, he loves me, he loves me not. But God says, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you. Now, what we do about those thoughts is another thing. Do we cooperate with the thoughts of peace? Do we cooperate with God's intention of good? And, of course, he's not a God of evil. Do we cooperate with calling upon him and giving him the chance to hear us and answer us and show great and mighty things? You know, many people think years gone by, you know, man, I'm going to do a 40-day fast before I die. Someday I'm going to do a 40-day fast. That used to be the big thing when I was in Bible school. I don't know of anyone that did it then. but uh, And then you'd read a book of some great heart or some evangelist or some famous uh, personality who fasted for 40 days. Now, I remember one great evangelist, he went to his closet, told his wife not to disturb him. He was going to fast for 40 days, came out after two and a half hours, and wondered how many days he'd been in the closet. <laughs> See, his body was in the closet, but his spirit and his heart was not in the closet successfully before God. So God has thoughts toward us, thoughts of peace, thoughts of answered prayer, thoughts of good, not evil, thoughts of all of our Scriptural prayers being answered, and that when we seek Him, He will be found of us, and that God will literally turn away our captivities. God will set us free from the bondages. God will help us to release the baggage. All of us have some along the way to be free. So that's the thoughts of God. And I don't know how that affects you, but you know, there's many people that live a miserable life because they think God doesn't love them, that God's afraid of them. And uh, I was getting a card in a card shop, and I don't know the, I don't know all these little characters, but they had one out there that's blown up, you know, and this little girl said, Mommy, Mommy, that's just like what comes into my room all the time. And she said, Mommy, it's real. It's real. I see this all the time. And it was a weird-looking little character. You know, about so tall. And I thought, you know, that's probably real to that child. And she probably got it off of television. And so something probably is coming in her room. And the mother doesn't have enough spiritual comprehension to understand that. I'm going to tell you, folks, everything in the world is knocking on the door of our children and our grandchildren and your heart and your life. And we're going to have to learn how to scream no in a way that we've never said it before. In the name of Jesus, no, no, no. I don't receive that which is not of God. I do receive that which is of God. So that's what God's thinking about you. Now let's go over to Ephesians, the second chapter. And I want to give you from the New Testament a further insight into how God sees you. And what God is doing in your life. Really, I guess maybe some pastoral from the heart teaching and ministry is where I'm coming from this morning. But folks, why do we know so much about everything else and so little about who we really are in Christ? Why are we so worldly wise? You know, honestly, I, I see things and hear things. I have to say, who is that? Oh, don't you know that's the latest big fad or that's the latest? I don't care. Amen. It's not going to help me. It never has helped me. I'm interested in what God has said. And the Bible said in Ephesians, the second chapter, you, you, what is God thinking about me? And you 
hath he quickened. I mean, you have been given resurrection life by the power of Almighty God. You. Forgot and left my lights on the other day. And uh, that battery was dead. I mean, it gave no <laughs> promise of doing anything. In fact, it was a couple of Sunday mornings ago, and a couple of the men of the church ran out and got it started for me, and I appreciate that so very much. But you hath he quickened. Unto you, to me, has God given resurrection life. You know, folks, if we just realized how powerful we are in Christ, you'd be hard to control this morning. You are not just a statistic. You are not just a Sunday morning churchgoer. Inside of you is the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And your body may feel dead. Your brain may be tired. Circumstances may have been trying. But I'm telling you, there's a battery inside of you called the Holy Ghost. I said there's a battery in you called the Holy Ghost. Resurrection life is in your spirit. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past, time past. Oh, aren't you glad that we don't have to go back to the past? You know, the devil always wants to talk to you about your future and put some doom and gloom there. Talk to him about his past. He doesn't want to talk about his past. In times past, you walked according to the course of this world. You did what everybody else does. According to the prince of the power of the air. It was like a puppet on a string. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation, words, in times past, times past, times past, times present, and times future. Thank God I've been delivered from times past. And my times present is in his hands, likewise, my times of the future. In times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, it was our nature, the children of wrath, even as others. But God, oh, I love the but God promises and truths in the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, but God. What about God, who is rich in mercy? You know why you're sitting in that pew today? Or if you're hearing us as every service is broadcast live worldwide over the Internet, or if this comes to be a radio message, oh, listen to me. Thank God. God has had mercy on you. Mercy and grace. Rewrote my name, your name, all of our names. God who is rich in mercy. No room for pride here. It's just thank you, Jesus. Amazing grace. For his great love wherein he loved us. And I think that's one thing that I really want to emphasize and get over to your heart. God has a great love for you that is beyond your understanding. A true parent, a child may do the wrong thing, but the heart of a true parent loves. You don't love their deeds, you don't love their wrong, but you love them. And God, for his great love, I mean, this word just goes crazy. You can run it out and just, just follow his great love. It means love beyond your understanding, love beyond measure, love beyond degree. I mean, just above and beyond and whoo, God's great love. Not small love, good love, great love. God's great love toward you. Oh, that's so awesome. 
Thank you, God, for your great love that a man such as the one who wrote Amazing Grace could even be born again, much less give us amazing grace. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love. Do you know it's going to take eternity for God to explain his great love to us? Why would he love us? Why would he have patience with us? Why would he come to forgive us? Why has he given his son? Why? 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 It's going to take eternity for God to explain his great love toward you and toward me. His great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, that's the thing you don't understand. God saw the diamond in the rough. God saw the gold. <laughs> God saw the potential of Jesus in you. Even when you were yet in, dead in sins, dead, dead, dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. When we were dead, unlovable, would you want the Apostle Paul to be the next pulpit guest, knowing what you knew about his past? No. Would you give the Apostle Paul the vote to come in and be the new pastor of a church? No. Would you vote him in to be the, the president of a seminary, the, the one who persecuted the church and murdered believers? But God, with his great love and his great mercy, he looked beyond all of that and called him to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell you, folks, our God is an awesome God. It's not a light thing that I'm standing here this morning preaching the gospel to you. It's not a light thing that you're sitting there listening to me. It's because of his great love, God's great love. We were dead in sins and trespasses. The Bible said, hath raised us up together, raised us up. I want to tell you something, believers. You're called to a higher plane. Never measure yourself by the, Somebody said, well, I know, I know people that don't even serve Jesus that, uh, you know, they're, <laughs> yeah, but they're going to hell. Don't measure yourself by the best example of this world because you still fall short. There's only one thing that can make us acceptable to spend eternity with Christ, and it's the precious, precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And raised us up, raised us up. He didn't just save us up. But he raised us up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God calls you to better than this world system. God calls you to better than maybe what some other believers might be. He's raised us up to sit together with him in heavenly places. How dare we let the anchor of this world drag 24-7. I'm called to a higher plane. I'm called to be a member of, the, of another army. I'm called to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. And that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of of his grace. Just what I got through saying a moment ago, it's going to take eternity for God to explain to our understanding why God loved us so dearly and consistently through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not by joining a church, though that's a wonderful thing to do. Not by praying, not even by giving of tithes and offerings, but salvation is by grace. Hallelujah. Through faith, not of yourselves. 
He gives us the faith to even believe for salvation. Come on. He gives us the faith to even believe for salvation. That's why we feel so emphatic about altar calls. You don't just come to God when you want to. Guess who gives you the want to? I've talked to people about Jesus that were as dead as a slab of concrete. When your hearts are tender, never let it cease to touch your heart. The people who were lined across this front area this morning, tell it through the Metroplex that there was an altar call on Sunday morning. People answered that altar call and we unashamedly called them to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a big deal. It's important. It's hard to get saved in a lot of churches nowadays. <laughs> you, you really have to work at it. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. But even a gift must be received. I've tried to give gifts that were not received. I've tried to give gifts of my kindness through God. I've tried to give gifts, even monetary. I've tried to give help, real help to people, but the gift was not received. See, Jesus is the big gift. I'm a little gift. But through me, I'm a distributor of the gifts of God for this service at this moment. It's the gift of God. Folks, everything we have is a gift from God. Everything that we are that's good is a gift from God. The fact that God has kept us, watched over us, helped us. I mean, last few months, I've seen people that have served God over a period of time just go goofy. I mean, you don't know, well, you, you don't know what doors have been left open, and that's a good message, don't leave doors open. But I mean, people that you've seen on track for God, and all of a sudden there is no rhyme, no reason, you find no point of reference. Man, you talk about something scary. Thank God I can still be touched by the Spirit of God. Thank God I can feel that gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit to the left, to the right. Stop. Speed up. Stand still. It's a big thing to be able to Sense that nudge of the Holy Spirit. You may not get the full message, but you get, <laughs> you know what God's basically trying to say. So we had a bad past, but there was an awesome Savior. His name was Jesus Christ and is. We look at his great love for us that's beyond our comprehension. He gives us so great a salvation. And how it all happens is by faith through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then God has raised us up to sit together with him in heavenly places. Kind of makes me want to just break forth into the song. I'm not going to do it right now. Just look what the Lord has done. <laughs> look what the Lord has done. Heal my body. Touch my mind. Save me just in time. Just look what the Lord has done. After all you've been through, and here you are in church on Sunday morning. My, my. After the heartache, the heartbreak, the physical attacks, the mental attacks, the emotional attacks, the family attacks, the financial attacks, and here you are on Sunday morning praising God with all of your heart. And then just to think that God has you on his mind. And he's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. His thoughts for you are good. Now, you have to cooperate with that. You can disregard that. and You can choose to go your own way. It's the old story that I've shared many, many times. So it's raining. So you have an umbrella. So you hold your umbrella and say, why do I get wet? <laughs> Open the umbrella of God's word and God's promise, and it will shelter your head from the rain. God thinks about you. His umbrella of his word is over you. You're constantly on God's mind. He's thinking about you. 
God has given the greatest gift that could ever be given, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave him for you. Jesus went to the cross for you, paid the ultimate price for all of our sin. Hollywood and a few others said that Mel Gibson was too gory with his film. No, it wasn't realistic enough. And it was, it was realistic. Folks, we'll never understand. We'll never understand until we're eternally safe in the presence of God. His great love, the price that has been paid, I believe the marks will be in him for eternity. Maybe not, maybe so. But they were on this earth. Jeez. And you know, here's something that I want to just, God help me, it's, it's such a simple but such a profound truth. Here's another reason why we're still on two feet and we're still going forward. Did you know that Jesus is constantly praying for you? He ever liveth to make intercession. With all he has to do and yet he has you on his heart and on his mind. We're making it because of God's grace. We're making it because of our faith in the finished work of Calvary. Yes, I understand that. And we're making it because we continue to make good decisions. But also, we're making it. How many times? I know, I don't know, it was a few weeks ago. It was just one of those pastor's days. And I just said, God, please lay me on somebody's heart. I need, you know, I, there's a thousand different numbers I could have called, but I mean, I didn't have time to do all that. I just said, God, lay me on someone's heart. And I found out that God did lay us on someone's heart at that exact time. You know, that's God's mercy and that's God's grace that someone would have a thought of you or of me or of any of us. My, my, my. He's praying for you. And he's praying for you to make it. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. Because you have a glorious future in the Lord Jesus Christ. But even a gift must be received. I don't know about you, but these thoughts have just been going over and over in my heart. What is God thinking about me? Read Jeremiah 11, 12, 13, right through there. Turn over to Ephesians. Don't just stop with Ephesians 2. There's one of the truth that I'd like to leave because it's very much in my heart. You know, you go back through the law. In fact, you go to Hebrews chapters 1 through 7. Man, you better thank God we're not under the law. All of us would have to have a truck to bring our sacrifices to church. <laughs> I mean, all the things that the priest had to go through. I mean, it's, it's and it was real and there was powerful truth in every step of what had to be under the law. But thank God, beginning about chapter 8, but one man, one man, one sacrifice, once and for all. <laughs> Millions of animals that were sacrificed and slain. All the blood that was shed through Blood sacrifices. One man, one sacrifice, once and for all. Oh, I got a nerve there. I, I, we struck some oil there. I, I want to drill a little bit more right there. One man, one sacrifice, once and for all. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Thank God I don't have to come with all the sacrifices. And if I missed one step in the eight steps into the, you know, to the worship. And it's all good. And it's truth and it's there. But man, I just read through Hebrews this week and I'm just been Galatians. And go over and see that Christ has set us free from curse of the law, you know. Folks, I'm telling you, we ought to thank God 24-7 for Jesus. One man, one sacrifice, once and for all, did the equivalent of the whole Old Testament. Plus the New Testament even coming to our day right now. One man, once, oh, 
<laughs> one man, one sacrifice, once and for all. You know who he did it for? You and you and you. He did it for all of us. But even a gift must be received. 